today's talk uh, uh, is uh, uh, on uh, the question of uh, the brother's hatred of Joseph and other challenges of Bible reading. Uh, and I'll start uh, with this. Uh, and by the way, if I, it's okay with me if you have a little schlock, a little snooze, but I think. I think, Trice, would you mind killing the lights because there's too much glare on this screen? And and I just yeah, kill them all. Yeah. Okay. Again. So now it's after lunch. That's why we're me. I have to I won't be offended. It won't be the first time uh, people have fallen asleep while I talk. Uh, okay. Uh, David Steinmetz, who passed away recently, a great scholar at Duke Divinity School, wrote. Uh, 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 I agree that the Bible should be read like any other book. The question is, how does one read other books? Uh, he was taking aim uh, in this at a tradition of critical reading from Hobbes and Spinoza in the 17th century all the way to today, in, in, in which the purpose of biblical criticism was principally to discover what the original author meant. In Steinmetz's view, this was not only an impossible task, but an incorrect one that could not possibly address the riches of the Bible or what it might say to later generations. And I'm going to focus today on uh, uh, three passages, the hatred of Joseph, the man in the field, and the sale of Joseph, all from Genesis 37, the formal beginning of the Joseph story. Uh, uh, and I could have taken the three modes of reading, which I'm calling, uh, and we can talk about why uh, I use these terms and not more technical terms, uh, literary, uh, devotional, and critical reading. I could have taken each one of these and shown you examples of literary, devotional, and critical readings. But I wanted to make the case that sometimes we should vary our reading methods in order to get the most out of a particular passage. So to do that, I had to choose, I thought, three different passages. So let's just dive right in here. The first, uh, the first example is the strange genealogy that we find in Genesis 37 too. Uh, uh, this is the line of Jacob. Uh, Ela told Yaakov, and what ought to come after that, and does come after it nine times in Genesis, is a listing of the sons in age order. So the thing that should come next in this sentence is Reuben. That's not what appears next. Instead, we begin with a clause. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended the flocks with his brother. Now, uh, this uh, uh, this deviation from a fairly strict genealogical formula is explicable because, after all, it's Joseph's role that enables the line of Jacob or Israel to survive. And more broadly, at least in rabbinic traditions, uh, it points to the many similarities between the lives of Jacob and Joseph. Uh, they were both favored. They were both favored by one parent. They had sibling rivalry. Uh, they had to flee, they achieved success in a foreign land. The rabbis, as you can imagine, made an almost endless list of similarities between Jacob and Joseph. But there's no question that the genealogy is a little bit strange. The, the, the narrator tells us explicitly that uh, the, the brothers hated Joseph. Three times, uh, and we know this, uh, 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 the, the, the brothers see the favoritism, exemplified by the uh, 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 you know, multicolored coat or long, long sleeve garment, the uh, famous multicolored dream coat. They hear that Joseph had brought bad reports to Jacob, and they can tell uh, 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 that uh, uh, you know, he is hated. Now, the question is, what, how is he, that he's hated, we have no doubt. Why is he hated? And, in fact, the text, again, <coughs> is very explicit in the reasons for the hatred that the brothers have toward Joseph. Joseph is a tattletale. He brings bad reports about 
uh, about some of the brothers. Uh, it says explicitly Israel or Jacob loved Joseph best of all his sons. It's sort of a public declaration. He made him this ornamental tunic. Uh, when uh, uh, his brothers saw that their father loved him, in other words, it's a publicly known thing that Jacob loves Joseph more. Uh, and then, of course, the infamous dreams repeated not once, but twice, these obnoxious, self-aggrandizing dreams uh, that get a lot of textual play and really uh, 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 provoke uh, the brothers. But the, the, the question is, is being a privileged, preening, grandiose, self-important tattletale, <laughs> is that really enough <laughs> to deserve enslavement or death? especially when you're 17 years old. Uh, and, and so I'd like to, to address this by saying there's a little bit more to the story, uh, and uh, I would like to address it uh, using uh, a, a very famous literary critic by the name of Auer, Eric Auerbach, uh, who's a whole story in and of itself. And he has famously described biblical characters as fraught with background. In other words, to understand a character or an incident in the Bible, you have to read not only the immediate context, the opening verses of Genesis 37, you must look backwards to see what has happened beforehand. And it was Auerbach's view that, uh, uh, that I say, unlike a Homeric epic, this is the only way to properly interpret the Bible. Uh, so let me give you three examples of where I think we understand this hatred better if we go before the beginning of the Joseph story. So, first of all, uh, the text, and if you know Genesis, you'll excuse me for being so elementary about these things, but not everybody knows Genesis as, as well as they might. Uh, uh, we are told explicitly that Jacob loves uh, Rachel and not Leah. We're told it a couple of times explicitly, and we're told it a few more times inferentially and via the narrative. And what's not expressed in these lines is the fact that Leah has four children, she, and through her handmaid, a couple more. In other words, these boys are growing up seeing their father, uh, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Judah, are growing up seeing their father goo eyes over the beautiful Rachel and treating their mother, Leah, as the unloved wife. Now, it doesn't say that, but we know from the chronology that these are not little kids. They see this and they surely draw some conclusions about Jacob and his relationship. Here's a second example. Uh, Naming speeches in the Bible uh, are, are very, very important. They, not every character gets them. If they're given at all, they're important, and you have to pay attention to them. The general scholarly agreement is that the naming speech usually tells you about the namer as well as the name, or maybe even more so. So in the case of Rachel, her speech when she names Joseph is a double speech. She says, uh, God has removed the reproach of my infertility uh, and given me a boy. And then she goes right on to say, may God add another boy to me using different verbs, but verbs that sound a little bit the same, asaf and yasaf. And in the middle of those <coughs> two naming speeches, one of removal, one of addition, we have the name Yosef, uh, Joseph. Uh, given. And this says a lot about Rachel, the shame that she felt at not being able to produce a child, and also her tough character. Rachel is really, in some ways, the right wife for Jacob. She's tough and he's tough. They both want a lot out of life. And she wants a second child, and of course the bitter irony is she gets it, but she dies uh, giving birth to Benjamin. Uh, uh, so that name and speech talks about Rachel, but it also talks about Joseph. Because if you were to think of a character in Genesis who is first taken away, Asaf, and then added back with great increase, well, surely that character is Joseph, who's taken away from his family 
down to slavery in Egypt and is then brought back later as the savior of the entire family, as the vizier of that same country. So this uh, is, is, I think, important enough, but I think this transitional verse is sometimes overlooked because it says, Ka'asher yalda Rachel et Yosef, after Rachel had born Joseph, but I would argue there's almost more, it's more than juxtaposition. It's almost A leads to B. And therefore, we are now thinking about teenage boys, the four boys of Leah, and the handmaid's boys, all with friends, school friends, school chums, grandparents, uh, uh, clubs and sports teams they may belong to. Okay, probably not, but you get the point. And they are all in Padanaram, perfectly so far as we know, happy until this incident, the birth of the favored wife's son, Joseph. At which point, and only at that point, does Jacob say, I'm out of here, I'm going back to the land of Canaan. Now, I don't think you need to be a uh, Freud to understand what kind of effect that might have on the other sons who are, in fact, uh, now forced to go on this rather long trip because of the birth of the newest rug rat. <laughs> <laughs> and then, here's the kicker, and none of this is, I think, none of this is, is hidden. It's just a matter of not being formally part of the Joseph story, and therefore not often brought to share on the Joseph story. Here's a, uh, the uh, incident which many of you, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that pretty much everybody knows. Jacob finally has his reunion with Esau after uh, a few decades. Uh, but when they last left, it was certainly not on good terms. Uh, Esau says, let but the mourning period of my father come, and I will kill my brother Jacob. That's not a good way to leave things. And Rebecca, uh, who is a very savvy we're not told that Rebecca hears this, but she can see, she's a mother, she can see her son Esau and his face, red, red, angry face, and she says, uh, why should I lose two sons in one day? And she sends Jacob way off to Mesopotamia, to her family, and that's where he is for 20, 30 years until he reunites, or, or, or re-meets, I should say, Esau, and he does not know what Esau has in mind. Is he going to forgive him, or is he going to kill him? And being the ancient Near East, is he just going to kill him, bad enough, or is he going to kill his whole family? Maybe it's, he doesn't, Jacob clearly doesn't know. But what, he, what we know, because we read the text, is that it says, he lines up the kids to meet Esau with, uh, uh, with the handmaid's children first, then the children of Leah, and then in the last and presumably safest place, Joseph and Rachel. And in case you think this is a, just a, oh, this is, you're making a mountain out of a molehill, this piece of information is repeated three verses later. So what I would say from this first example is that uh, uh, you really can read the Joseph story as a self-enclosed unit, Genesis 36, 7 through 50, but if you read it in light of what has gone before, then the brothers' fratricidal impulses toward Joseph, I don't say that they're excusable, but I do think they're more explicable. And therefore, uh, from uh, what I would call just a very simple reading of the text, we can see that there's quite a bit more to Joseph's brother's hatred than might appear in Genesis 37. Okay. Let me take the other two examples I won't develop quite as much. The second example is a strange interlude uh, in Genesis 37. Remember, all these examples are from Genesis 37 only. Jacob tells Joseph to find his brothers who are shepherding. Now, given the tensions in Jacob's household, you might really question Jacob's um, emotional intelligence as a father, and in fact the rabbis did, and raked him over the coals for thinking it was a good idea to send Joseph to go find his brothers. 
But what matters, I think, here is Joseph's one word response, hinani, which uh, generally means I'm here, I'm ready, I'll do, I'll do what you say, Dad. And, and in fact, Joseph heads out uh, towards Shechem in order to find his brothers. But a funny thing happens along the way. He meets a guy, and you can see the text here, and the guy says, what are you looking for? I'm going to paraphrase in your style. I'm looking for my brothers. He says, well, they're over in Dotan. They're not in Shechem. You've got to go the other way. And by the way, Shechem and Dotan aren't that close. Uh, and so here we have a, uh, an interruption in the narrative. And uh, uh, as uh, the literary, British literary critic Gabriel Josipovici uh, writes in a wonderful book uh, called The Book of God, he writes, the passage is not one that immediately springs to mind when one recalls Genesis 37, and it is easy to see why. It is obviously trans transitional. The narrator wants to get Joseph from the safety of his father and home and into the clutches of his brothers. But why, if that, sorry, if that was all he wanted, introduce the complication of the man in the field? I think that's a totally fair question. Why did this interaction occur at all? Why couldn't he have just marched directly to Dotan? Unless, of course, you're a complete literalist. And you think, well, because they weren't in Shem, they were in Dotan. But OK, we're not going to go there. Uh, uh, and, so, and, and so far, so good. Now, Josipovici thinks uh, this passage is unnecessary and superfluous, and I have no argument. But he goes on then to make another statement which I find more problematic. The man in the field and the young man in the linen cloth, that's from Mark uh, 14, uh, 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 who runs away naked, uh, uh, leaving the cloth there. And that's not incidental. It's probably a verse provoked or prompted by the story of Joseph and Potiphar or, or from, 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 from other Hebrew Bible tales. How, how they came to be there cannot be gainsay. To interpret them away is to do away with the whole Joseph story, the whole passion narrative, and in the wake of this, the whole of Genesis, the whole of Mark, the whole Bible, in the end with the whole of literature. <laughs> well, I think you'll all agree, and it's very well written, I'll we'll take a little over the top. Uh, I'm not sure one uh, needs to go that far, uh, but I do think uh, what I uh, want to underscore here is Joseph Josephovich's point, which is that interpretation is sometimes not necessary and always must take second place to the narrative. And I think that um, this is um, a, a, it's a dictum. I don't agree with it. Uh, and I would like to suggest that once in a while, Maybe a turn from a plain literary reading to a more devotional reading, and I'm using that term devotional to grab a whole lot of stuff, but you can chide me for it after I'm finished. Um, this, uh, one, let's take a, a rabbinic example. Now, the rabbis didn't like anonymity. They didn't like it at all. Every anonymous character, and there are, or, who is a non-named character, gets associated with a named character, or not every, but many. Every event that is given no particular date is assigned a particular date. Most events are nailed down to a particular holiday, Jewish holiday, and even human practices and behaviors are often by the rabbis linked to a particular person. So for instance, <coughs> Noah is associated with drunkenness, and many other things too, but he's seen by the rabbis as someone who initiates drunkenness because he's the first person to get wasted. Uh, Jacob is associated with the travails of old age because he's the first person, not, with, not counting Isaac's blindness, but he's the first person who suffers greatly as a result of being old. And so the rabbis connect a lot of these human behaviors to the first appearance of, or first character. In the case of this man in the field, it is intolerable from a rabbinic point of view that we say nothing more about this person. 
The guy doesn't have a name. And so here are three medieval responses to this question of who is this guy? The first from Rashi, the most well-known of all commentators. Then a man found him. This is the angel Gabriel. As it is said, and the man Gabriel, quoting Daniel 9.21. Uh, now this is Vagim uh, Se'ehu Ish, Gabriel, Shenemar, Daniel, Tech Kapala, Baha'ish, Gabriel. This is thin as thin ice. Okay, we, we, can, we can be a little bit uh, blunt here. In other words, because Daniel describes Gabriel as the man, and because there's a man here, <laughs> otherwise unaccounted for, we're going to say that this man is in fact the angel, the angel Gabriel. And that's Rashi's answer, which, as usual for Rashi, he's deriving <coughs> from older sources. That's neither here nor there. Does everybody agree with Rashi? Not in this tradition. Abraham Ibn Ezra says, A certain man came upon him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you looking for? The certain man, according to the plain sense, is one of the wayfarers. In other words, this is an area in which people are shepherding flocks, and they come hither and thither, and it's not so unusual to bump into a wayfarer. And in, there, Ibn Ezra actually has two versions of this power commentary. And in the longer version, he has uh, inserts the question, please tell me if you know, a kind of avoiding, easing the problem that how would this guy know if he's not some kind of angelic messenger. But the bottom line here, I hope you see clearly enough, is that Abraham Ibn Ezra is rejecting Rashi's solution. A, it's not Gabriel, and B, it's not an angel at all. It's just a shepherd. So let's go to a third rabbinic uh, response to this question, who is this guy, uh, Ramban. And he sort of, in my opinion, he kind of splits the difference between these two. The Holy One, blessed be he, sent Joseph, a guy without his knowledge, in order to bring him into their hands. It is this that our rabbis intended when they said that these men were angels, for these events did not occur without purpose, but rather to inform us that this is the counsel of the eternal. And that's a biblical quote as well. In other words, not the angel Gabriel, maybe not even an angel, Nachmanides is hedging, Ramban is hedging his bets here, but certainly an agent of divine providence. And I would say that this is obviously interpretation. That's not what the text says. This is what Ramban says it says. But in this case, I would argue that a devotional perspective gets you somewhere in reading the meaning of the text that a simple, plain, or simple, literary analysis just can't get you. Okay. I'll take my third example. Uh, and then uh, we can have some questions and discussion. Uh, the third example is dealing with not the very end of Genesis 37, but getting close to the end of Genesis 37. I hope you're wondering at this point, how is it possible that so much is in a single chapter? <laughs> this is true, actually, for every biblical chapter. And here we have the sale of Joseph. And if you break the sale of Joseph down, it's a very, very confusing narrative. Uh, uh, it's not perplexing, like the previous narrative, why is the guy in the field, it's downright confusing. We have Reuben, we have Judah. We have Ishmaelites, we have Midianites. We have a plot to kill, we have a plot to save, come back later and save, that's Reuben's. We have a plot to sell, we have Joseph drawn out of the, drawn out of the pit by Midianites, we have him sold to Ishmaelites. We have him then resold, taken and resold to the house of Potiphar down in Egypt. And we have, as if this weren't bad enough, Medanites. And that could just be a scribal error. Maybe those are the same guys as the Midianites. But we can't be absolutely sure. After all, the vocalization is different. The vowels are different. And so here, we have a text 
that seems uh, to me like the beginning of a crime drama episode. Law and Order Special Victims Unit, <laughs> CSI Dotan, uh, take, take your pick. Uh, and the, the rabbis, frankly, uh, came up with solutions, but very unsatisfactory ones. They couldn't agree with each other. And that's not unusual in a matter of interpretation. But this is a matter of not even agreeing on the facts of the case. Who did draw Joseph out of the pit? That's not the thing that rabbis usually argue about. It's the meaning of that that they argue about. This is a matter of not even being able to agree on the facts. And so I would say a devotional perspective in this regard is problematic when you can't even agree on what the facts of the case are. Once again, you could simply treat this in a literary way, and I realize I'm using literary extraordinarily broadly. And there's a very good uh, article by uh, a scholar named Edward Greenstein, uh, which I, uh, you know, he applies, um, you know, he says, I'm taking a postmodern approach to this, and I'm treating this narrative like a cubist painting by Picasso, or um, a, a film by Kurosawa, and he says, quote, an equivocal reading of the sale of Joseph leads to the realization that in the view of the narrative, it is not crucial to our understanding of the story whether the brothers sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites or whether the Midianites kidnapped him. It is important, rather, to perceive that the descent of Joseph to Egypt and his subsequent rise to power there reveal divine providence in history. This, of course, is the single most pervasive theme in the Bible. Uh, in other words, uh, the reader, and I think this is, I think, I believe I'm just restating Greenstein's point more simply, is deliberately, the narrative is deliberately leaving the reader unclear. Because the important thing is not who sold whom to who to whom, or who dug him out of the pit, or how exactly he got down, Joseph got down to Egypt. What matters is the sense of the reader that this is uh, indeed, the working out of divine providence. Okay, I think that's, um, t to my mind, um, uh, uh, not much more satisfactory in this case. I mean, I, I don't disagree, but I don't know if that gets you as far into the text as you might like to go, and I don't know if it's really that much of a improvement upon the devotional reading style of the rabbi who assume the Torah is uh, God's word uh, encoded. So let me uh, offer you a third reading method, and that is the critical reading method, or first critical reading method. Uh, at the very beginning of this talk, I mentioned David Steinmetz, the late David Steinmetz. Maybe Professor Hicks Keaton studied with him even. He did. Uh, a very great scholar of the Protestant Reformation, maybe. Uh, Steinmetz uh, assigns, uh, he takes as representative of the critical approach this 19th century Oxford professor named Benjamin Jowett, who was in fact a particularly egregious example of arguing that there was no point to biblical criticism. The only point was to find out who said what to whom all those uh, millennia ago and what that person meant by it, and then we can go on and, and go on to some more valuable pursuit. Uh, uh, but in fact, if you were thinking about source-critical method, Benjamin Jowett would not be the first name that would jump to the front of the line. It would be the fellow in the middle, Julius Wellhausen, who is usually incorrectly credited with synthesizing about 100 years of documentary explorations and coming up with the idea that there is a J, an E, a P, and a D source all in operation in the Torah, and that really we were talking about four principal authors, not one. Uh, one could talk about that, of course, forever, but I won't. I'll just say that that view has been uh, updated uh, very successfully by this, this fellow over here, Richard Elliott Friedman, a book who wrote the Bible, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, a great, uh, well-written, accessible, uh, treatment of the source critical approach, and by this young fellow uh, over on the right, a guy by the name uh, of Joel Botten, who wrote a book in 2012 reviving the documentary hypothesis. Now, 
uh, their solution to this sale of Joseph is quite different and I think quite elegant. In other words, you can divide the sources out without doing any textual damage to the text into a J account, which talks about Judah, which talks about Ishmaelites, which talks about sale, and which talks about Ishmaelites again, taking Joseph down to Egypt. If you had only the J version, you would say, that's a perfectly coherent narrative. And on the other hand, there's an E source connected with Reuben, connected with a previous desire by the brothers to kill Joseph, connected with Reuben's desire not to have the blood of their brother on their hands, but rather to cut double back and save him from the pit. And then, when uh, they come by to, 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 to give him, to get the, to, 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 here it's the Midianite traders who pull Joseph out of the pit. And Reuben comes back to the empty pit in which he thinks uh, whether there's water in the pit or not is debatable. Uh, but Reuben comes back, finds uh, that there is no, uh, no boy in the pit, and says, now what am I to do? Ana uh, Aniba. Where will I go? How will I explain this to our father Jacob? And we have Midianites, Reubenites, a plot to kill, a plot to save, and a failure of that plot. And according to the documentary hypothesis, this is also uh, uh, a coherent narrative. So what you have in the Bible in Genesis 37, according to source-critical approach, is two perfectly coherent narratives that were combined, leaving a result of a narrative that is actually quite confused. And uh, and you can say, along with Greenstein, it's deliberate confusion. You can say with the rabbis, we just have to keep arguing until Eliyahu comes, Elijah the prophet comes, until we can, and Elisha can solve all the details of the argument. Or you can say, really, the simplest way to get to how this text works is to accept the fact that there are two authors at work. So I'll conclude with this slide. Uh, I turn back to David Steinmetz. Uh, I agree that the Bible should be read like any other book. I actually don't think that's possible, um, but uh, it's still a good comment. Uh, the question is, how does one read other books? And I've tried today to show with one chapter of the Joseph story that you can actually use three different ways. A, the Bible may be read like a literary work, with its particular characteristics. That's how I would prefer to read the opening of the story and Joseph's, the brother's hatred for Joseph. <coughs> you can read it like a divine code which discloses secrets deliberately placed there by an author. As the medieval Jewish mystical work, the Zohar says, woe to those who think the words of Torah are the Torah. Those are only the garments of Torah. And the real Torah is something else altogether and far more wonderful. Or you may read it, as source critics do, as a pastiche of ancient traditions, reflecting internal tensions between different sources and different parties. However, as all of us who've taken standardized testing, and sometimes still administer standard, standardized testing now, there's always a fourth answer, which is D. The Bible may be read as well as the above. And personally, that's where I favor. Thank you very much.